morning and everyone uh, in between. Good morning. Great to have you on board. Um, Aaron, which camera am I looking at to talk to people online? The Zoom camera. Got it. Got it, got it, got it. All right, let's say good morning to a few people. Got my computer back up here on the stage. Carrie down in Texas, good morning. Scott Wheeler's in house checking out the YouTube signal. Connie Sandbrink, uh, firmly rooted Greendale. Nikki and Chuck, Cape Girardo, I guess it is. Good morning from Cape Girardo, Chuck and Nikki. Jenny, good morning, good morning, good morning. And what else did I want to do? Oh. I have a Rumble screen that tells me that there's at least 10 people watching on Rumble. 11, 12, woo! Um, it's good, it's good everybody. They say that for every signal that you, anybody you got attached to a live stream, multiply it by 2.2 because sometimes there's probably a family there or a couple there. Um, so yeah, we're climbing up on Rumble, which is awesome. I don't have Twitter uh, on here, so I can't check that. But let me get back to the main stream yard. There it is. Okay. All right, you ready? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, bless the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts. May they be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, in Jesus' name, amen. Is someone playing me? I'm hearing me in the background. Shirley, are you playing me? What's going on? You're, you're wanting to drive me crazy. Is that what it is? <laughs> My app's going crazy. My phone's going crazy. Steve, help me. <laughs> Shirley, if you can't behave, if you can't. All right, well, I'm off. Well, don't shut me off completely. Um, all right, everybody, last week... We had a tremendous digression as we went to Ephesians chapter 6 and looked at the full armor of God. And so um, I want you, I've been trying to bring that full armor in to the 9 uh, o'clock prayer time. I'm trying to make that something that we bring into our DNA that I, I would like to picture ourselves doing a number of things in the morning before our feet hit the floor, which includes when you shut off the alarm on your phone, put the phone back on the nightstand. Don't make flipping through the phone the first thing you do. Stop. Start having some spiritual disciplines where if there's always an enemy that's out to get me, then every day I ought to prepare, right? Jesus says, if you knew a thief was coming to your house and robbing it, would you just leave the doors open? No, you'd armor up. You'd get ready for the thief. Well, every day there's a thief that wants to rob our relationships, rob, rob our peace, rob our whatever, and we just seem to kind of float along, and oftentimes we're battered around like a ball in a pinball machine. Putting on the full armor of God. Waking up thanking God before you hit the floor, thanking God that you're breathing again, and your heart's going in and out. Don't, get the ch don't go through the checklist of all the things you got to do. Remind yourself who God is, who you are, all the things that we've been talking about. Because I think all of that is a process by which we find our stewardship, our, our discipleship stewardship finds its alignment when we know how to live in the wisdom of God while we're walking in the kingdom of this world. God doesn't tell us the, the, the Middle Ages was wrong. We don't build places where Christians go hide. We're supposed to so root ourselves in God's love and his eternal truth that we infiltrate back into a world to redeem and to save, to fight the enemy. So... Uh, in the case of Nehemiah, you have the obvious. You've got God's promises. He's got to remind himself constantly of God's faithfulness. 
But his eyes, if he walks by sight, he's going to be seeing and feeling that maybe things aren't as clear as God seems to make them, and hence, how do I walk that walk, right? And Paul ultimately says, we walk by faith and not by sight. Sometimes we see the best when our eyes are closed. Putting on the full armor of God. Why? So at the end of the day, we might stand firm. You're either going to gain territory or lose territory every day. Because there's a battle. You've already lost if you don't think there's a battle. <laughs> if, you, if you wake up and live a day and don't think there's a battle, you lost. But the goal is to gain territory. Nothing can stop the movement of the kingdom. Nehemiah is trying to gain territory. He's trying to, and I don't mean physical territory, a domain. God promised that they rebuild Jerusalem. God promised all these things to happen, and he is forcibly trying to make that happen while faithfully he's relying on God's promises. Does that make sense? All right. Um, so let's finish up chapter 4, uh, verse 21. So we continue to work with half the men holding spears from the first night of light of dawn till the stars came out. At that time, I also said to the people, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so that they can serve us as guards by night and workmen by day. Neither I nor my brothers nor my, my men nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon even when he went for water, even when he went to sleep. Even What he's saying is we were always ready. We were always ready. I want you to jump back just for a second to verse 20 and listen to his rally cry. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. What's that phrase? Our God will fight for us. Highlight it. See, sometimes we think we're fighting alone. Sometimes we, we feel like somehow we've been thrown in this big arena and we're, we're battling alone. Had a great conversation with someone recently who, who uh, was learning some things. About living the Christian life in tough times. Living a faithful life in tough times. And all of a sudden, this individual went to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We all know they survived being thrown into a fiery furnace. They were thrown into a fiery furnace. God did not rescue them from being thrown into a fiery furnace. We all think that God should just give me peace and I should never suffer. And every, every book of the New Testament mentions suffering. The Christian life is a hard life. But what makes it good is all the certainties we have about the kingdom of God. The, the realities cannot be taken away. So whether I die today or don't die today, it doesn't matter. I'm going to be in heaven I'm going to be in a new heaven where there's a new heaven and a new earth. I'm going to be in some place where my, my immortality can be lived out in the garden that God promised. Daniel, with all of his faithfulness, was still thrown into the lion's den by the king. He just survived. The lion's mouths were closed by God himself. The three men were all of a sudden four as God was in the fiery mix with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. One of the most overwhelming things, brothers and sisters in Christ, is to think you're battling by yourself. It's too overwhelming. But if God is for us, 
Who can be against us? So you see it? See, Satan would beg you to, okay, have that faith. Now let's go to battle, just you and me. No, we go to battle with him. The, the God of the universe is on our sides, right? That song, um, This Is How We Fight Our Battle, right? It may feel sometimes like we're surrounded, but actually the enemy is surrounded by the forces of God. Right? There, amen. Amen. Thank you. And so we got we to gotta not allow ourselves to get isolated in our living out our Christian lives in this world. We need to be united with one another, and we need to know that the God of the universe is for us and not against us, and that nothing can stand against the movement of his kingdom. There are principles that we just have to hold on to, even if our eyes are lying to us. Olivia Thompson, good morning. Good to have you on board from New York. All right, chapter 5. Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their Jewish brothers. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. So there's a food issue. It reminds me of Acts chapter 6, I think it is, when the, the church is getting so big and the um, the distribution of food is getting difficult and twisted and hard, and the need to raise up elders to make sure that the distribution takes place properly is that Nehemiah is not only dealing with rubble to make a wall, he's not only dealing with the pressures of uh, powerful people who want to overpower him and, and destroy whatever he's trying to do. You got the everyday safety issues. You got people with a sword in one hand and trying to do work in the other. Now, they're hungry. Ever been in one of those moments where it's always something? You think you, hurt, you got over one hurdle and it's another. It's always something. Who's our battle with? The enemy. Our battle is with the enemy. I would say more and more in our world today, in our society today, we got to begin to exercise walking by faith and not by sight. Tying into our messages lately, we better realize that there's way too much lying. There's a verse in Isaiah where he says, truth is nowhere to be found. It's been trampled upon. Well, that's what the enemy does. The enemy is a liar. He's a murderer and a liar. He doesn't know any other language but lying. And if that becomes prominent, if that lying becomes prominent, it's going to get into the civic circles. It's going to get into the churches. It's going to get into all sorts of things. And hence our whole domino message is this idea of the church at least needs to restore its understanding of truth. Because if we don't, who is going to? <laughs> if we don't, no one else is going to because we are the church. In that amazing dialogue between Pilate and Jesus, Pilate says, so are you saying that you're a king? He says, you're right in saying that I'm a king. And for this reason I came into the world and for this reason I was born, that I might testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. That's not just a little phrase. Jesus is saying, in the course of world history, the church has always been the thing that rides on the wave of truth no matter what. And hence what happens are revivals. All over the world, societies begin to crumble and fall because lies will ultimately kill, steal, and destroy. Understand that. It doesn't matter whether I tell you it's a truth. Right? I can tell you it's a truth, but if it's a lie, 
it will steal, kill, and destroy. We already know how this all works. But just look at the church over history. Look at God's people over history. Every time they stuck to truth, every time they were unbending, the nation bent. Did it mean the church wasn't persecuted? Oh, it went through it. <laughs> but it, it expanded under the persecution. It grew under the persecution. Now it's food. Nehemiah, one of the things we know, he's got a tender heart. He, 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 he feels the things, the pain. Remember, he, he walked two or three days before he even talked to them about his plan. And he's, tar- he's trying to di- digest for himself what this all means and how this is affecting these poor people. Others were saying that we're mortgaging our fields and our vineyards and our homes to get grain during the famine. Ooh. I wonder if the United States should worry about the fact that for the first time in our history, credit card debt went over $1 trillion. We're mortgaging ourselves to eat, to pay for gas, to provide heat for our homes. I'll tell you, one of the things that I am quite certain of is the government's no good at doing what the church should be doing. We care for the poor. We care for the widows and orphans. Others are saying we have to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. That this isn't just this isn't just physical threats, it's economic threats. It's not like it used to be before. It seems like there's always a handout that we've got to pour money into and and we're not getting it's not that we're not getting ahead, we can't even maintain. And all of this, even though Although we are of the same flesh and blood as our countrymen, and though our sons are as good as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. We're even selling our children into slavery so they could earn more money for us to survive. There's a portion of the Jewish people that have stayed in the land that are being treated differently than those who returned from Babylon, from Persia. Sound familiar? Creating a cultural divide? It's one thing to ideologically have differences with people. It's another to force it to have an effect on their ability to survive. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. They don't even belong to us anymore. We've mortgaged everything. We've sacrificed everything. We're even selling our children into slavery, and we still are fighting to eat, just survive. We're blessed to live in a nation that for the most part hasn't lived like that. But but do we often think about the fact that we're in the top 3% of the whole world and the rest of the world does live like this? 
are we so encased in our little bubble that we don't think that we could be next? When I heard their outcry and their charges, I was very angry. Angry with them? No. Nehemiah is a feeler. He feels it. He feels their pain. He feels all of it, and it's not right. It's not what God would do. Like his insides are just, just exploding. I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and the officials. I pondered the whole situation and realized it was the government's fault. I realized they were lying. I realized that they were doing the wrong thing. They were taking advantage. So I told them, you are exacting usury, usury, you're charging exorbitant interest on things that you're letting people borrow, which was a no-no in the law. You are exacting usury from your own countrymen. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, as far as possible, we have bought back our Jewish brothers who were sold to the Gentiles. Now you are selling your brothers only for them to be sold back to us. They kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. Just want to pause for a minute. There are key points in the New Testament where Jesus asks questions. Most often he's in a Pharisee's house or he's in a synagogue and he turns around and asks a key question like, is it good, is it right to do good on the Sabbath? Is it right and okay to heal someone on the Sabbath? And the religious leaders stayed silent. Those sons of a guns, they've never been silent. They are constantly blurting out stuff. But when they get faced with truth, they become silent. One of the things I want you to realize and always realize, and I say this so often, especially in relationship type things. Stop yelling. Truth doesn't need your volume. It's powerful by itself. Yellers, screamers, cussers, throwing things, that's the enemy. Because he uses violence because he doesn't have anything backing him up. Proverbs tells us when you see violence, you're seeing the outcome of lies fighting with truth. But Jesus could silence a room just with a phrase. Make people chew on the truth, not your actions. Right? How many times have we said to our kids, because you're screaming and yelling at me, the only thing that I'm thinking about is that you're screaming and yelling at me, even though I'm, you're bleeding and you say your brother hit you, I don't care right now because the way you're treating me, i got to deal with that first. You see what that does? Now, if we do that in a very loving way with our kids, just think how the enemy uses that. He doesn't want you to talk about the real issues, so all of a sudden he got you over here, got you over here, got you over here. He got hatred over here, anger over here, someone fighting over here, and all of a sudden you don't even know what the topic was. How did the thing even begin? Nehemiah speaks truth and people are silenced. Because truth does that. Why? Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus says. Truth is the only thing, like light in a dark room, 
that pierces through all the noise and goes to our conscience, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Right? It's different than the noise I'm hearing. It's different than the argument. It's different. All of a sudden, truth is spoken. And you go, ooh. It's what truth does. It's why we firmly root ourselves in God's word, his eternal truth. Whether it's good or bad news, it's good for me, right? Sometimes the law is spoken to me in love, and you go, oh, got to repent, got to work on that, got to fix that. Sometimes it's when we're feeling low, the gospel, grace, faithfulness, forgiveness lifts us back up. We know that truth's powerful. So Paul ultimately says, speak the truth in love. That's it. He didn't say win the fight, win the argument. He he didn't say anything. He just said, speak the truth in love. That's what Jesus did. Did Jesus win over everyone that he spoke truth and love to? No. Some people will follow the enemy, believe in the lies, and they'll tumble down a different road of dominoes. But not this time. There's so many parallels between Nehemiah and the early church and how it's moving and how you're fighting with external forces and still trying to do the right thing faithfully. And So they kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. So I continued, what you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the what? Boom. I'm not getting into a debate with you. Your debate is with God. What does God's word say? It's the battle, everybody. Did God really say? No, I don't think he said that. I don't think it means that. No, this, my Jesus wouldn't say that. My God wouldn't say that. This is what my, I, 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 I think that that's not true. Okay. But just know you're saying that to God. You're now saying you are more important than God's word, and you somehow know better than he does. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom is the activity of living truth out in life. Wisdom is not knowing information. Wisdom is knowing the truth of God and having the ability to live it out in every situation that I'm in. That's what Jesus could do flawlessly. What that takes is an understanding that it's not about me. It's about him. Hence why the first domino is God. But if there is no God, well then, it's a free-for-all. And you watch the dominoes fall in a lot of weird places. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? You're no different than them. And hence you're bringing a reproach into the image of God's people. Church, Why do so many churches want to become more like the world thinking that that's how you relate to them when God says, no, just the opposite. Stand out. Be a a, a peculiar people. You're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. You don't belong to you. You belong to God. And he's got a plan for you. Hence, identity. He knows you. 
He created you. He gave you gifts and talents. He, he, he has a plan for you and me in the kingdom of God that we're called to live out even while we traverse in the kingdom of this world. Shouldn't you guys have a fear of God and avoid this reproach? I and my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain. But let the exacting of usury stop. Stop the interest. If God has blessed me with $100 and somebody needs $100 and I give them $100 and they say they're going to pay me back, then okay. I was able to give them $100 when they needed it, and a month later, two months later, they give me $100 back. Boom. Oh, no. I want some interest on that, baby. I want. I want. Who says? Where'd you get the $100 in the first place, Tom? God? See, proper understanding of stewardship, it's not yours. Somebody, wake up, man. That, there's an amen there. It's not yours. You and I are stewards of what God gives us. If he gives us life today, we're stewards of this life. If he, if he gives us our mind today, we're stewards of how we think and feel. It, 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 if he gives us resources and we see someone in need, we, we, we meet the need. Why? Trusting that God's taking care of us and we're called to take care of them because we're being Jesus to people. It's how the kingdom of God works. Don't have a banquet and invite all your friends who are just going to invite you back to your own, a banquet of theirs and you guys just changing houses and having your little... Go to the streets and get the poor, the broken, the hurting. Have a banquet for them. Remind yourself and them that they're Amagio Deo, that they're created in the image of God and that they're worthy. The body of Christ, Christians should be open-handed, not closed-handed. It's not mine. It's the whole issue of stewardship. But pastor, I don't have any time to give to the church. I'm so busy. You got the same 24 hours that Jesus had, same 24 hours that Jacob had, you got the same 24 hours that everybody has. So there isn't a reason that I wouldn't, except that my priorities are somewhere else. You ever thought about the fact that to be a disciple of Jesus Christ requires sacrifice in the kingdom of this world? In order to become a pastor again, I left a really lucrative job. It's not about the money. Proverbs says over and over again, that when you give to the poor, it's like lending to God. Huh. How do we give God anything? Every time we steward our lives, we're giving back to God. Because that person's a Maggio Deo. Created in the image of God. Blessed is the manager, the steward, who understands when the master says, go to work, do what I've told you to do, that even when he's gone and away, you keep doing what he asked you to do because you know it's the right thing to do, and you don't start thinking to yourself, he's never coming back, I can do what I want today, no. 
Because he's going to come back at a time which you don't expect him. He's going to come back, and so whether it's day or night or whatever, be the steward of your time, talents, and treasures so that when he comes back, boom, he sees you doing exactly what he had you commanded to do all along. How do we wrestle ourselves out of that we have the same 24 hours that someone else has? But every day we have to choose what we're going to do in those 24 hours. That's it. The 24 hours are happening. Unless your heart stops beating, the 24 hours are going to happen. The ticker seconds are going to run. The question is, what do we do in that time period? That's all our choices. We make the choices. Nobody made us do it. But God has a desire for those minutes and seconds. God has a desire for those dollars and cents. He gives to us freely and then we charge interest. But my life is supposed to be a reflection of him. Hence, I have to give freely. The disciples end up setting their nets aside and going to become fishers of men. There's always something that we have to let go of in the kingdom of this world in order to serve because each kingdom can take all 24 hours plus. Is that making sense? Come on. Each kingdom wants 24 hours. You don't have 24 hours for each kingdom. You got 24 hours for one kingdom. You see it? So Paul says, even if you go to work, do it with all your might. Do it as unto God, not unto men. I think we create a mental separation between the two kingdoms when it's a theological separation. Eventually there will be one kingdom, and that's the one that's going to be for eternity, but it is already on this planet now, and we are called to live in that new kingdom. Paul says that we're ambassadors to that new kingdom. That we're no longer citizens of the kingdom of this world. All the language is from the early church is that you understand who you are and whose you are. And that directs every moment of your day. We created a Christianity that says I get to live my life. I get to own stuff. I get to do whatever I want. As long as I go to church on Sunday and put a little bit of money in a plate, I'm good. But Jesus never describes that Christianity. He never describes that. We're even lending money, but we're not charging usury, so it needs to stop. Give back to them immediately their fields and vineyards, olive groves and houses, and also the usury you are charging them. The hundredth part of the money, grain, new wine, and oil. Give it back. Just give it back. Because it's the right thing to do. Not a one of us can outgive God. And if we're honest, he has faithfully given to us even when we don't deserve it. It's because even when we're faithless, he can't be. He's faithful because he can't deny himself. See, one of the questions is, as we live out our 24-hour days, is how does someone who's not a Christian see my life? Do they even see that there's a difference? They charge usury, I charge usury. They do this, I do that too. I mean, if there's no difference, 
<laughs> then there's no difference. Does that make sense? Which means if there's no difference, you're in the wrong kingdom. Because there is a difference in his kingdom. He gets to set the rules. It's his kingdom. Just like he set the rules in the original kingdom, the garden. See, he's still God. You never get to be God. You and I never get to be God of anything. Jesus says in that whole section about worry, it caught me a, a month ago or so as I was doing those daily devotions, um, that, that why do you worry, Right? Lilies of the field, the birds of the air, you know, God knows how many hairs on your head. Why do you worry, blah, 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 blah. And he says, by worrying, can you add one hour to your life? Now, the fact is, it actually shortens, right? Because stress and anxiety shortens, but... But I'm not, not sure the point that, he's, that that's what he makes because we forget the next phrase that Jesus said. If you can't do that little thing, then why do you worry? What do you mean, little thing? Oh, this is the God who stopped the sun and the earth from moving so Joshua could fight a whole nother day. See, if we believed in the God that we really have, we would not worry. We would actually help some people in the kingdom of this world not worry because they'd want to know why we're so crazy, peaceful in a time that's not so peaceful, and it's because we're trusting in a faithful God and we're trusting in his word, and all of a sudden, that person wants some, and that person wants some. See, how we live at our Christian lives has historically always been what created the allurement, the attraction. Who is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? Who is this that can touch someone and heal them? Who is this that has changed my heart? Who is this that has righted every wrong? Who is this? Well, people see Jesus in us, they're going to ask the question, who, is, who are you? Why are you different? Nehemiah is being different in a similar kind of worldview that we live in. They respond repentantly. We will give it back, they said, and we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. Then I summoned the priests and made the nobles and officials take an oath to do what they had promised. What does that mean I summoned the priest. Come on. I think you're on, but take it up a level. What? To who? God, I'm not just getting an earthly agreement from you. Call the priests. Because the truth that I'm stating is connected to the truth of his word. And if you now are repenting and you now are committing yourself, we're going to the priests, which means we're going to God, and in front of God, we're making this agreement. Our focus always should be the kingdom of God. In this crazy world, where's the kingdom? In this crazy world, how do we be the kingdom? In this crazy world, how do we infiltrate? How do we be Jesus? Our goal is not to condemn, but to redeem. Not to judge, but to set free. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon us because the Lord has given us the ability to set captives free. He's basically saying, let's take it to God. Now that we have this agreement, 
let's notch this up and remind ourselves we're not making an earthly agreement, we're making a divine agreement, a spiritual agreement. I also shook out the folds of my robe, and I said, in this way, God, shake out of the house and possessions every man who does not keep this promise, so may such a man be shaken out and emptied. By who? God. (laughs) You realize what Nehemiah is saying? Anybody remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira? Yeah, we sold our land, but you did. Yeah, here's the money. Is that all of it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Dead. Why would you lie to the Holy Spirit? Peter doesn't say, why do you lie to me? When the church realizes that we're speaking on behalf of God and not ourselves, we'll stop having human authority. Why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? Ananias is dead. They take out his body and Sapphira, his wife, comes. Same thing. Did you sell your property? Yes. Is this the amount you sold it for? Yes. Why did you lie to the Holy Spirit like your husband? Dead. (laughs) It's no little thing to lie to God. I'm just trying to tell you. There's no little thing to lie to God. There's no little thing about living a lie because he already knows, right? I mean, like, he knows the stuff in me that you'll never know. But the day I wake up and realize he knows all that stuff is the day that I become broken and empty, ready to be filled. But the day that I think I'm hiding it from God is the day that I'm just lying to my own soul and putting my life at jeopardy. He's trusting that if anybody out there goes against this promise that we've spoken before God, God himself is going to shake them out and cause all of their wealth to fall out, and it's going to be the churches anyways. It's going to be the body of the kingdom of God's anyways. Have you ever seen God do anything like that? Yes. It's how he eliminated Saul as king and brought in David. I could go on list after list after list of God moving heaven and earth because someone wouldn't do what they said they would do as someone didn't do what God said he wanted him to do. We would beg that God would be so merciful to treat us like Jonah, right? At least we survived in the end. But not everyone does. Lying to God is, a, is huge. Putting words into God's mouth that aren't his is huge. Saying that something that God says is false is huge. God can put up with a lot of things, but when someone gets in the way of his word, he has reacted throughout human history powerfully. Removed whole nations. Why? Because it's his word that saves souls. If you're going to start messing around with his word, he's going to mess around with you. It's what makes me so nervous all the time. Like I just say too many words. You're fearful that you say something wrong, that you misunderstood scripture, that you, 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 you created a theology in your own head, that something yucky, oh my gosh, and to hear words like, and he's going to hold me and others like me more, more accountable. Why? Because we were handling his word. At this, the whole assembly said, Amen. And praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. Everyone, this is, this is hugely victorious. Right? Right? I can't even think about what the equivalent would be in our society today. Next to what has happened at least two other times in American history, where social issues and political issues 
are addressed, not because they're social and political, but because they're transgressing God's word, revivals have taken place in this country because of that reason. But the only way that happens is if the body of Christ is faithfully delineating the word of God and faithfully ready to live out the word of God and faithfully ready to speak the truth in love and faithfully ready to witness to Jesus Christ and not just be a mirror image of the rest of the world. If we're like them, there's no difference. See, we look like them, but we're really different, right? That old bumper sticker. The only difference between you and me is Jesus, potentially. Moreover, from the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, until the 32nd year, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers uh, ate the allotted food for the governor. Nehemiah didn't take advantage of the food and support and supplies that the king promised him. What did he do with it? He threw it into the coffers of all the food that needed to be distributed to people in need. He was a steward of what God gave him for the time period that he was in. Did he have an earthly right to have that food? Yes. Did he have an earthly right to have all that food sacrificed and put on his tables? Yes. He had the wisdom to say no. And he still survived. He didn't go hungry. He didn't starve. It's incredible. Jesus says, man does not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of the Father. Tells the disciples that I have food that you don't know about. But the earlier governors... Those preceding me placed a heavy burden on the people and took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to food and wine. Their assistants as, um, also lorded it over the people. But out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to the work of this wall. See, he came in as a governor. He came in as someone really, really important. He came in as someone who could sit on a uh, his chariot, he could ride around and watch everybody work, he could, he could be a taskmaster, he could be all those things. What he became is one of them. What is it? Homothumadon. One mind. I can't set myself apart, Nehemiah is saying. i got to become one of the people. If they're going hungry, i got to give up my food. If they need support, I've got to give up. I got to give support. If they're weary and tired because they're building a wall, I got to come alongside that. Where is that in your reaction? I guess would say to the church, and I'm going to end here in just a second. Where is it? Why does 10% of the church fulfill 90% of the budget? Why does 10% of the church is usually the same 10%? Do all the work of the church. Why? Have you ever asked the question? Like, why is that? It's because a certain group of 10% are seeing the 24 hours they have different than everyone else who has the same 24 hours. Because they're just as busy. I can tell you that those people have jobs and they're engineers and they're going to banks and they're traveling the world and they're traveling the country and they're doing their jobs. But how do they do it? They trust that God's a good, good father. And they steward the kingdom of God first and this world second. Seek first the kingdom of God this second. And in doing so, they found a balance What a balance? The balance is an imbalance. God somehow continues to give as I'm given to the church because he's a wise investor. 
God gives to the one who gives. God gives to the one who gives. God keeps pouring into the open hands of someone who pours back out. He just keeps that flowing. He keeps that flowing. But as soon as someone does this, they're going to fight their whole lives getting one, needing more, needing more, needing more, and more hours and more attention and more stuff's going to be spent and more energy's going to be spent because you're warring against the Word of God. And I'm the pot calling the kettle black. This is something that Kimberly and I had to fight with. This is something that we had to not fight each other, fight. Raising seven kids. I had every reason in the world not to tithe, not to give them my time, not to give them my talents. I was angry. I had other reasons not to do certain things. But when God of the universe says, Tom, I don't care what you think. Right? When the God of the universe says to you, how dare you spend time preaching to people how they ought to live and you don't, is the day you wake up. And you become part of that 10% that does all the work. Because you don't want to have another choice. It's his it's his. But I pray for the church that 70% of the people do 100% of the work and 100% of the giving because 30% are newly Christians that we've just gone out and won and we haven't made them disciples yet. Picture that church. Pray for that church. Does that make sense? Are you all good? You've been really quiet. I had no amens in the last 20 minutes. One, two, three. Amen. All right. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and grace. We thank you for the power of your word. Your word says that it never comes back void or empty, but it always does its work. I pray it's doing its work in the heart of this preacher as well as in the heart of everyone here in the building and anyone online who's listening to this message. And Father, please prepare our hearts for the message. Father, we're hitting tough stuff and sensitive stuff, and I'm asking for your supernatural peace to fall upon us all, that we're yearning to hear truth, and that, Father God, the spirit of offense be gone in Jesus' name. Because, Father, when we're offended, it's our feelings. It's not our minds. It's not our thinking. We've got to stop thinking with our feelings, and we've got to start thinking with the minds that you've given us. Prepare our hearts. And we pray all this in the precious name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. All right, thank you. And uh, in a few minutes, we're going to commune the worship team.